All right, hi everyone. So for those who haven't met me before, I'm Mark. I'm going to be running you kind of through the first half of this presentation. Uh, and then Cheng Wang is going to take over in the second half and talk about some experimental work we've been doing uh, recently at UWA. So in terms of what we're going to talk to you about today, firstly, kind of kind of a bit of summarize some of the uh, experimental data we've got in our nucleation measurements here at UWA uh, and the hundreds of different industrial industrially relevant data sets we've uh, measured so far. We're going to, then going to talk about how we're going to scale these or a way in which we might scale these data sets to uh, a field sort of scale and using the way we propose to do this is using a conceptual model based on nucleation theory. And the essential part of this is identifying the interfaces in a flow line which control the nucleation rate. And Kwong Yi spoke about that a little bit before in terms of our droplets and things like that. And I'm going to hand you over to Chang Wong, who will talk to you a bit about the next generation of apparatus that we're building here at UWA and really starting to target system size scaling uh, of the nucleation rate. So as a bit of a summary of, of where we're at, the HPS Alter journey sort of started in 2018 with the first formation and growth rate measurements of methane hydrate. We've then done things like showing induction times, so the wait time to form is exponentially distributed for a system not containing KHI. We've also looked at effects of varying KHI dosages. We've looked at combined THI and KHI inhibition strategies. We've also shown, uh, which I spoke a bit about last time, that with the KHI in your system, your induction time is no longer exponentially distributed, that's now gamma distributed. The KHI ranking for your system can depend on the subcooling and also depends on which uh, metric you use to evaluate it. And finally, more recently, we've shown that MEG doesn't impact nucleation kinetics only, the uh, formation temperature in your system. So the question kind of comes, so we've got all these very uh, relevant but disparate ideas conducted on a bench scale apparatus. How do we actually get this to a flow line? So most of these insights have come from either the HPS Alter or from the acoustic levitator, which like I said, are on a benchtop scale. And then we want to get this up to a flow line. And to go from these two very different scales, we need some sort of probability-based scaling model, which is what we're going to be focusing on uh, today. So bringing it back to our conceptual picture of how hydrates form and plug gas dominant systems, we start off with these dispersed phases and then hydrate starts growing in our system. So we're going from a system without any hydrate to a system containing hydrate. And the gray in this picture is meant to represent hydrate. Well, we're actually missing kind of a key insight here, which is to go from a system not containing to containing hydrate, the hydrate actually has to nucleate. So we're going from this dispersed and random system to a very well ordered and structured crystal. And that has a lot of implications for both the time it takes to form and the formation likelihood in our system. What this essentially means is that we have an energy barrier associated with that ordering that means that hydrate formation in our system isn't instantaneous, even if it's thermodynamically stable. So what this actually is, is an interplay between uh, two competing effects. So we have this red curve up here, which represents the energy penalty for introducing the hydrate interface. And then we have the light green curve, which is the energy, uh, it's not an energy penalty, but the energy uh, reduction we get from introducing a more thermodynamically stable phase. And the competing effect of these two different penalties with a change in the nucleus size gives us that blue energy barrier there. So probing that energy barrier is really important because it manifests as either an increased time to form, so an induction time, or an increase in driving force required to form. So we'll have to go to a higher subcooling before we form hydrate. Where this actually happens in our system, or where hydrate formation happens, I should say, is where this blue energy barrier is lowest. And that's what we call either nucleation sites. So that's what we call nucleation sites. And that is usually either at impurities or interfaces in our system. So what we might imagine is if this little gray box down the bottom represents our nucleation site, we're starting outside the hydrate stability region where it's not stable. Even when we enter the stability region, we don't see instantaneous formation. And we have to increase either the, or wait an increased amount of time or the subcooling has to increase before hydrate will form. So now if we want to actually probe where these nucleation sites are in our flow line, if we think first about what we actually need to form hydrate, which is gas and water, nucleation sites are places where there are gas and water present together. So this is kind of like a cross-sectional schematic of what you might think a pipeline looks like. We have some water droplets entrained in the gas phase, 
and we have some gas either dissolved or as bubbles in a continuous liquid phase on the bottom. So I've highlighted here all the different regions that might uh, correspond to nucleation sites in our system. I'm just going to run through a bit of the nomenclature in terms of what we actually call these. So the first one is where we have gas and water phases in contact with the pipe wall. We call this the three phase line. We then have where maybe a gas bubble or some dissolved gas is um, dissolved in the water near the pipe wall. We call that the water wall interface. It might have a free gas bubble in the liquid phase. We also have the whole bulk gas water interface in our system. And we have a water droplet up in that entrained phase. We can also get something similar to either the three phase contact line or the water wall interface if there's any um, condensed water on the top half of this picture. So a lot of our work here at UWA so far has actually been focused on trying to separate out these different interfaces to find out which ones are, are the most important for understanding our nucleation rate and formation likelihood. So doing the top half of this picture is quite easy because we have a levitator which can separate out the steel in space essentially from our system. So a lot of work that Kuang Yi's done and Cheng Long's done experimentally has been looking at the nucleation rates of these droplets in a continuous gas phase. But the question is less clear in terms of the bottom half of this picture. But a lot of the work we've done here is by using the HPS Alta, which is this stirred steel reactor. We have a continuous liquid phase. So now I'm going to move on to talking a little bit more about how we actually quantify nucleation rates and what they are experimentally. Um, kind of that was more of an introduction in terms of the model that we're, we're going to use to interpret some of these results. Understanding the nucleation rate is really important to understanding the formation likelihood in our system because it tells us on average how long we will have to wait for hydrate to form. So nucleation theory tells us that the time to form or the induction time is exponentially distributed with a rate parameter J. And J is what we call the nucleation rate. And what that means uh, essentially is that we have these kind of S-shaped um, formation probability curves. And we've shown this both for the acoustic levitator and for the HPS alter, where if we hold it at a fixed subcooling, our time to form is exponentially distributed. And what J physically means, as I said before, is how many critical nuclei form per unit time. What we actually see in terms of this, this, these distributions is we're may wait, waiting many hundreds or thousands of seconds. So we're looking at values of J which are much lower than one for these systems. And the whole idea of where this is going and why this is relevant is that if you know how J changes as a function of subcooling, you can predict the probability, which is uh, P of T on the left hand side of this equation, associated with any time T, uh, the induction time in your system. Now I'm going to go into a bit more, I guess, uh, nucleation theory itself, and it does get a bit hairy, but I'll try and step you through it uh, slowly. But what we can actually do, aside from looking at J at a fixed subcooling, so we can also look at how J changes with subcooling. And this actually gives us a lot of fundamental insight into those nucleation sites, which I was talking about before. This is the classical nucleation theory equation for J. It's quite hairy, but the main point to take away from here is if we put, uh, plot J as a function of subcooling, which is in red, we can get information about these parameters A and B prior. Now, what A tells us is information about the number of sites in our system, and B prime tells us about the energy barrier at these sites. So again, kind of bringing this back, if we measure J at a lot of different subcoolings, we can get this really fundamental insight from nucleation theory. And why that's really important is because different systems will have different number of nucleation sites. So we might imagine, for example, that this is what the site energy distribution might look like in our system. I stress I'm not saying that it is a normally distributed thing, but it's just as a kind of conceptual picture. And where we are on this curve or how many sites are accessible in our system depend on what subcooling we're at. So when we're at a low subcooling, we can only access the low energy sites in our system. But when we increase the system subcooling, we can access more sites. That essentially means, as we would expect, at higher subcoolings, the nucleation rate is going to be much higher in our system. Aside from looking at, say, the dependence of J on subcooling, we also need to understand how we're going to scale the number of nucleation sites from our apparatus up to a flow line. So essentially, the reason why we would expect a flow line has more uh, nucleation sites than a benchtop apparatus is if you think about all these interfaces in a benchtop, you've essentially just got more of them in a uh, pipeline. 
going from these two different sizes is not easy, but nucleation theory gives us a relatively robust framework to scale J with system size. So what you might imagine coming back to this uh, kind of picture that I showed you last time is that we might have, if we've got similar interfaces present in our system, a similar distribution of energy in our system, sorry, distribution of site energies in our system. But we'll have a very different number of sites. So going from our apparatus scale to our uh, flow line scale, we're going to vastly increase the number of sites. So understanding how to go from an apparatus to a flow line can be interpreted through this parameter A, which I've been talking about. What we've also uh, seen so far as well is that different sites have different, or sorry, different sorts of sites in our system have different energies. So the acoustic levitator, which looks at those droplets, has a lot higher energy sites, but there are a lot more of them per unit area. And that's really important for like what Kwong Yi was saying before, when you have all these atomized droplets at you know 10 Kelvin subcoolings, you get really rapid information and plugging. The question is, how do we actually know that? And it's quite a big conclusion to take. I'm going to step you through this slide, which is a bit more uh, kind of nucleation theory, but this is how we get these sort of insights out. So the important thing to take away from this is that this is that CNT equation plotted in a linearized coordinate with a X and Y as shown on the graph. And we can get two bits of information out of these plots. So each of these points corresponds to one of those nucleation rates measured at a fixed subcooling, and it's then linearized onto this uh, plot. The intercept of these curves, so these lines on this plot, corresponds to the log of the number of our sites in the system, or it's proportional to. The slope of these lines is proportional to the site energy barrier. So what we can see is that these droplets, which are the orange points, have a higher slope and higher intercept, which means we have many high energy sites in our system. I'll stress here that this is an area normalized J, so it means that per unit area, we've got many more sites. In reality, we've probably got more sites in, say, a small cell than there is in a single droplet. What's interesting, though, is in a bulk water system, so that we've measured in the HPS Alter with a similar gas mixture, uh, is we see fewer low energy sites. This is really important to understand where the sites are, what sort of energies they have, because we need to understand what the relevant interface is to actually do this size scaling which is kind of the point of trying to raise here. So in a droplet, for example, we know what the relevant interface is because we have a well-defined picture of what's going on, but it's a lot more complicated for the bulk water systems. So coming back, I guess, reminder again, we're trying to scale these nucleation rates for say either bulk water or droplets through this parameter A. Now for the droplets, like I just mentioned, the conceptual picture is relatively straightforward in that we could normalize the number of sites by the droplet area. We could then simply scale J up with the gas water interface area that we expect in our system. And that's some of the work we've been doing with the JT hydrate apparatus, which Kwangi spoke about earlier. And like I briefly mentioned before, the question becomes a lot more complicated in the bottom half of this picture, where we have lots of different interfaces competing in our system. And the question is, which of these interfaces is actually important for scaling up the nucleation rate? And to do that, we've been doing some recent experimental work by building some different apparatus sizes to hopefully change some of those and seeing what happens to the nucleation rate. So I'll pass it on to Cheng Long now, who's going to update you on some of that work. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm Cheng Long. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'll, um, I'm going to talk about how we experimentally investigating size scaling. So over the past years, as Mark pointed out, we have um, intensively studied hydronucleation and growth on second generation of HPS Alta. And to understanding the scaling room, we have developed uh, other uh, multiple HPS Alta systems, including nearly scale HPS Alta, also third generation of HPS Alta. So this um, set of HPS Alta system gives us um, different system sizes, includes uh, water gas interface area, street risk contact lines, and also the um, width area. Width area is um, referred as the wall water interface, as Mark mentioned earlier. So now today, um, I'd like to introduce our newly developed HPS Alta system, which is called Pat Alta or Pat Cell. So on your left hand side picture, that is uh, how the Pat Cell looks like in real life. And to better introduce the uh, structures of this Pat Cell, I'll just show some videos. 
So as you can see here, in the middle, there is a pipe, pipe geometry, and both end has flanges for the ceiling purposes. And also you can see that there is two bits coming here and here. That is actually the uh, aluminum cladding, which will surround the pipe for temperature control. And another component showing here is um, the insert uh, goes in the pipe, which will hold the uh, sterling freeze to provide some mixing of the to the system. And another two components here and there is um, the pipe support, which will hold the whole system on top of the uh, magnetic stirs. So, um, yeah, and I'd like to talk about more about the um, temperature control method and some of our amazing features of this system. So first of all, this figure shows um, uh, that you can see that there is a, a lot of water blocks and pieces attached on the pipe cladding. Um, and in this way, we can achieve a uh, fast thermoelectric temperature control, which has the same principle as the um, previous HPS Alta system. Additionally, we also have multiple thermometers inserted into the pipe to monitor the actual fluid temperature and to better um, temperature control and uniformity, we have divided the system into three sections and the temperature in each section has uh, controlled independently. Thanks to that multiple thermometers here, we can detect the hydro formation locally via temperature change or the temperature signal of the hydro formation. And another one uh, interesting uh, feature I'd like to mention here is the ability to provide the variable mixing speed and location. So with these features, we can change uh, the turbulence level of fluid inside the pipe. So potentially this feature can be used to um, investigate in the shut-in and startup process. So next one will be the um, next one will be the um, variable liquid loading, which is one important uh, features of this part as well. So by changing the uh, liquid loading, we can actually change the control, uh, change the water gas interface or through these contact lines. So here is a simple example. So when we have 35 volume percent of liquid loading in the pipe, that is how the um, full inside look like as the red, red rectangle um, mark here, that perimeter will be three phase contact line and the area will be the uh, water gas interface area. So what if we change that liquid loading from 35 to 90%? So that will be how it looks like inside the pipe. That apparently, although we that uh, increase the liquid loading from 35 to 90 volume percent, the water gas interface area has reduced by 70% while the wetted area increased by 80%. So this is gonna be really important uh, features in, in terms of the we are uh, investigating system scaling. So now I'd like to share some of our preliminary data. And it's showing in this temperature plot, so the system cooling from the high temperature to a, to a target temperature, which is 9 degrees C here. And we hold the system until the hydro formation. So how we detect the hydro formation is we have the uh, sudden pressure drop. So the pressure plot on your right hand side is showing here so the system pressure is decreasing with the decreasing temperature and which uh, its pressure plateau. So when the system first hit the target temperature, we turn the clock on and then we just wait until the hydrate forming and we turn the clock off. So in this way, we can measure uh, the induction time of this uh, particular hydrate events. And by repeating this uh, hydrate cycle over and over again, we can construct a uh, induction time distribution. So as you can see here, induction time remains exponentially distributed in the large part of the system. And from this plot, this distribution, we can extract the J or nucleation rate and compare with the HPS other data. So in this um, nucle nucleation plot, uh, the blue represents the methane hydrate nucleation rate in pipe cell, while the yellow represents the methane hydrate Nucleation rate in HPS and Alta. So the um, nucleation rate in pipe cell is a little bit higher than HPS Alta system, but they are of the same order of magnitude as those in HPS systems. 
So things are still early in this stage, but there is uh, one specific interesting result we can share with you. Although the inflation rate of the same order magnitude in HPS alpha, but the vector area is 10 times higher in top cell. So which means that the nucleation rate do not scale simply with the vector area. So yeah, and then uh, we expect there will be uh, it, with more experiment, we expect more useful information will come up. So expect this uh, newly developed pop cell. Uh, I'd like to mention another interesting apparatus will be commissioned in 2022, which is the hydrolyte pedal. So as Mark uh, mentioned earlier, we have a lot of different types of system sizes, and one will be the uh, water droplet suspended in gas, gas phase. In this case, we can uh, use the acoustic lift that are independently quantified uh, the raw of uh, water gas interface areas. But what about when the gas bubbles in the bulk water? So here's where the hydroelectric comes in. So there will be a high pressure measurement cell filled with water, and we inject the um, gas bubbles and acoustically lift the gas bubbles in the Fill the water. So in this way, we can also independently quantify how the nucleation rate goes and what's the role of um, the water gas interface in this case. Now um, I will pass to Mark to finalize this talk and thank you everyone. So wrapping up and bringing it all together, I guess the main purpose of this talk was mainly to give everyone a bit of a brief uh, introduction into nucleation theory and size scaling so that over the next year we can share a lot more of the insight we've uh, got out of this. And like I spoke to you about earlier, we've generated lots of different data sets that are industrially relevant, but we're now looking at how we're going to scale these up to uh, a flow line sort of scale. And the main issue that we've identified here is identifying the interfaces in a flow line which control the nucleation rate is essential. And then Chang Long spoke to you quite uh, extensively about the next generation of apparatus that we've been building, the pipe cell, as long as uh, alongside some different scale uh, HPS alter cells. Uh, we'd both like to thank all the supervisors who helped us with this project, as well as uh, Vincent, who did a lot of the experimental work in the early days, and to the ARC for funding it.